has been a reporter for Sports Illustrated, a feature writer for the Philadelphia Daily News, a news and sports producer for an NBC affiliate, and a TV critic for the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Asbury Park Press. But that's not all. He has more than 1,000 bylines in the New York Times and also writes for the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Philadelphia Newspapers, Sports Illustrated, Fortune, and more. And somehow in the midst of all that, he has found time to write a new book. And that book will be the focus of our, our talk today. The book is Worst President Ever, James Buchanan, The POTUS Rating Game, and the Legacy of the Least of the Lesser Presidents, which he will be signing copies of after the program downstairs in the main lobby. Please join me in welcoming our guest, Robert Strong. So Robert, I appreciate your uh, visiting with us today. And of course, um, to state the obvious, our, our meeting today is the timing could not be better. Uh, we have presidents on the mind, and we'll get there in a minute. But I first want to find out kind of how you got interested in studying presidents and particularly rating them. OK, well, by the way, can you hear me? I didn't know if my wife uh, might work. Um, I don't know about you, but my father was a, uh, well, he made me read every sign in front of every historical monument. In fact, if, if I had become the writer of those signs that you see all through Philadelphia, he would have thought that was the best job ever. Uh, so when I was a little boy, though, I, I, I always looked at baseball statistics when he brought home the paper, which he found well and good, except that, you know, that was still baseball. So he bought me this book. Hmm. Uh, and as you can see, it's so yellow, it's burnt sienna. And it, uh, it's called Facts About the Presidents, and it's sort of money ball for the presidents. Because you can open up to random pages, I will here, and it says James Monroe was the eldest of five children. His children were Eliza Cartwright Monroe, born December 1786, married. Anyway, you get the idea, right? So I sort of looked at that and uh, started memorizing all that stuff. Some people call it crap, but it's stuff. <laughs> but then, I always call it history, but go ahead. <laughs> history, right, right, right. Um, but then he, uh, he went out and bought me a set of, how high might you say these are? Three inch, two inch figurines of all the presents. Of course, given my age, they only go up to Johnson. But <laughs> one of them was my friend, my now friend, James Buchanan. And so, so, you know, I became a little obsessed with the presidents. Since I was an only child, I didn't have time to fight with my brothers and sisters, so I spent time looking up baseball statistics and presidents. But I, I, talked, I talked at Penn. I also teach at Penn a bit. And uh, when I went over there, the woman who sets up the programs uh, handed this to me. And it's a, uh, for those of you in the back, it's a Pez dispenser of James Buchanan. <laughs> Now, some people paid me to speak, but this is like, you know, you can't get both. But, but at any rate, so that's sort of how you know, my obsession with presidents came to be, as any of you might. And, and I'm a journalist, as you see, as you, you heard. I mean, I write about anything and everything. But um, I also play basketball. I'm an obsessive basketball player. And for those of you who live in Philadelphia, I play at the, at the sporting club at Broad and Locust. And early in the morning when we play our games, I park along 13th Street, where you can park till 8 o'clock in the morning before you get a ticket. So on that corner, among other things, if you've ever been down there, is the library company. Mm -hmm. And right next to the library company is this glass window with uh, Ben Franklin in a toga, which is a little s silly. It's also, it's also been the corner from the time I was a young man, where you know it was the late night corner. I, all I can say is that. You know, there were a lot of after-hours clubs back in the days when they had after-hours clubs let out. So I had a vision of that on that corner. But then I found out in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, right there where I park to play basketball, are the papers for James, or many of the papers of James Buchanan. So I figured Ben Franklin and Toga, bust out bars, uh, basketball, my basketball, James Buchanan. So I look up. I, I had a conception of James Buchanan being pretty bad president, but once you start looking it up, you know, it, 
I, I don't know what your favorite ball team is, but there is a worst player on that team that you hate. You know, you can't wait till he's traded, and he seems never to be traded. Well, you know, Buchanan is the president <laughs> that Pennsylvania could not get rid of. Well, it's a, and of course, uh, James Buchanan had an extraordinary history leading up to his presidency, and we're going to get there in just a second. Um, but before we do that, uh, talk to us a little bit about what criteria are important for you in trying to rate presidents. Right. Well, I think, uh, I think we're raters of most and everything. <laughs> um, you know, today, the uh, uh, basketball polls for college basketball has been going on for now, like two weeks. You mentioned weeks. basketball twice. You know, I'm from Chapel Hill. So you're I know, I know. Of, well, yeah. Davidson <laughs> plays uh, UNC not too long from now. My, my kids go to Davidson. Uh, the, uh, anyway, the polls come out today, and there's two different polls, one done by coaches and one done by uh, uh, writers. And uh, people will, like, who care about college basketball will look. I mean, you'll care whether North Carolina is seventh or sixth or fifth or whatever <laughs> it is, right? At the end of the season, there's a 68-game tournament. So all these little polls along the way are meaningless because there's going to be an actual tournament. But yet, those who are, are interested in that are, are feeling that way. So similarly, those who are interested in presidents, there's only 43, soon to be 44 presidents. Not that hard to rate them, really. I mean, uh, or at least have an upper echelon and lower echelon. And so I really only use the barest of uh, rating systems, and that's what did they do when they were president and what happened after they were president, mm -hmm. you know, the, the after effects of what they did. Mm -hmm. uh, a little more substantive, I suppose, than worrying about somebody's jump shot, but, you know. <laughs> uh, and so in, try, in, in looking at what the president did, uh, if we sort of zero in on that in a second, um, you're, you're, are you talking about sort of the successes and failures of the hand? Sometimes, sometimes however, you, you, do, you do have to say, and to use another president, say, a lot of historians like James Polk, because he came to office, he said he was going to do these few things, he did all these few things, and he got out. He left after one term. Now he died a few mm -hmm. months later, so he might not have lived for a second term, but nonetheless, he's viewed by many modern historians as somebody who's up there. Uh, so, so sometimes you have to take that as the bar. But mostly, you know, there's a happenstance of what happens over the four years of a term and, and, and how you react to it and, and what you, when you're faced with a crisis, what do you do? Or when you're not faced with a crisis and you have to introduce something, you decide to introduce something, whether it's worthwhile and how you adjudicate it. And who's at the top for you? OK. Well, generally, there's been a number of historian-based uh, ratings over the years. Arthur Schlesinger, the dad, started it after the war. After, oh, when you say the war, you know, there's many wars that have happened. But after <laughs> World War II, and, and there have been a number of things. The Chicago Tribune did one. And, and in any case, uh, in almost all of them, the top three guys, Sorry, they're still all guys. Uh, Washington, Lincoln, and Roosevelt. And most often, uh, Roosevelt is third, and the other two sort of switch. Uh, and uh, do, I, well, do I want to say why? Yes. But what, my why generally is, and this is, and, and the, the, the obverse is, is why Buchanan was not very good, is that they made decisions. Uh, Buchanan, uh, as, as, as the professor was alluding to, had the longest resume of anybody running for president. Now, I know you just went, sat through everybody saying how Hillary Clinton was the most qualified person, and not qualified, most experienced person. And, and I guess if you count her first ladyship in, in Arkansas and uh, Washington, maybe she adds up to more years. But, but generally, Buchanan was the, you know, served in the Pennsylvania legislature, served in both houses of Congress, was Secretary of State, was Minister to Great Britain, was Minister to Russia. He was said to be uh, on the short list to be nominated to the Supreme Court by two presidents. He ran for president, sort of, you know, how they run uh, and don't get nominated three other times. So he had a lot of experience. Washington didn't have to ha couldn't have had experience. I mean, he was a general and, and all that, so you can't really count him. Lincoln, the barest of experiences, a couple of terms you know, between uh, Congress and the state legislature. Roosevelt, a little bit more 
But Roosevelt lost a couple of races. He lost uh, it, you know, the nomination for Senate, a Democratic nomination for Senate. He lost, he lost as a vice presidential candidate. He was governor uh, of, uh, of New York for a term, so that's something. But not the great amount of experience you think that people should have. And, the people, and you know, uh, as especially in this election, they, you know, they're talking about Donald Trump's complete lack of experience in government. So, but the thing that they did is when they were faced with an issue, they made a decision. They, they must have known, back of their heads, it's not going to be popular in a lot of cases. And certainly in any case, it's not going to be 100% popular, but they decided on something. And when you're the boss, you know, think about being, if you were the manager of the Cubs and, and uh, the guy's on first base and you have to decide whether he's going to steal and you say, I don't know. What do you think? What do you think? By that time, he's picked off, right? So that's sort of, that's sort of what didn't happen in the Washington, Lincoln, and Roosevelt administrations. And of course, there, uh, just to kind of set the stage even more fully, there are a number of people, a number of presidents who came into office with extraordinary political backgrounds. I mean, right. Uh, John Quincy Adams, who even from a young age um, was an, an extraordinary figure in uh, right. the political life of the nation. Later in the 20th century, William Howard Taft, amazing resume. Even a president that perhaps we can talk about later as being either forgotten or, or poor, William Henry Harrison, who's only in office for about 30 days, actually had quite a resume right. um, up until he died. Um, uh, so what is it, as a, but you have a, a theory about whether the longer resume is really a liability, or at least a, a, a precursor or a signal that well, I don't know that I would call it a liability, but okay. it's not an enhancement necessarily. Okay. You know, it's not. It doesn't mean much. I mean, take my my buddy here, Buchanan. He was uh, he all that all that time that I told you about being in the legislature. He never introduced anything of substance. <laughs> he. Uh, he was a great conciliator. I mean, you know, look, I mean, when you write something bad about somebody, you also have to look at like, what he was good at. Well, what he was really good at, and I know this sounds trivial, but it's not. He was the best party giver in 19th century America. <laughs> and that, strangely enough, I think is sort of important, because when you're an ambassador, <laughs> when he's ambassador to Russia and Great Britain, he gives great parties. And when he wanted to be nominated to the Supreme Court under Polk, he, now he, he employed the best uh, chefs in Washington, such as they were probably, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and treated everybody. He was, he was apparently one of the you know, guys who, you, who wanted to please everybody. Well, as president, you can't do that. It just doesn't work. And uh, uh, so his great and, and as many people's probably great um, uh, thing of substance was a, was actually a detriment uh, to his ultimate job. Now, and so now we're almost here at the Buchanan presidency, and one of the things that's very striking, certainly unusual, and we may take us a minute to get our heads around this, is that the time he's going to become the party nominee, he's actually the ambassador to Great Britain. Right under President Franklin Pierce, who, by the way, is going to be near the bottom of that yeah, pile, too. too. So how does he get from being ambassador to Great Britain to actually leaping over Pierce to some extent to get the Democratic nomination for president? Well, in two cases, when he became ambassador, the presidents who made him ambassador, and this will make you think about what Mr. Trump might be doing, and that is they made him the ambassador to get, them, to get him out of here. You know, there's... I, I, I'm going to point out a real quick theme. You'll notice you know, Polk is thinking of putting him on the Supreme Court. Somebody else wants to make him ambassador of Great Britain. There's a real effort to get rid of this guy. Right. Uh, and there, and the people didn't seem to notice him. <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, Jackson uh, um, uh, is, you know, it's probably an apocryphal story. He's asked on his deathbed to start giving remembrances, and he asked him about uh, sending uh, Buchanan to Russia, and he said... If I could have sent him further away, I would have, <laughs> right? So similarly, Pierce wanted him out of the way so he wouldn't be challenging him for the next nomination. So he sent him to Great Britain. Well, it's a great honor, right? I mean, I'm sure that 
this whole thing with Romney and, and Trump is sort of along those same lines. Maybe not, but, but uh, um, so he's in Great Britain when everybody else has to make a decision on the Kansas-Nebraska <laughs> Act, which, which he should probably explain to you because he would, why don't you explain to him what that was? Well, so the Kansas-Nebraska Act uh, arises un under the administration of Franklin Pierce, and uh, Pierce actually um, was actually really presented with the Kansas-Nebraska Act almost as a fait accompli. He was a president who didn't make a lot of decisions, and when he did make them, mm -hmm. they were incredibly tragic and bad. Um, but one of the, so uh, one weekend, several people, including Jefferson Davis, show up at the White House, and they basically present to him this piece of legislation called the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which was going to create them, uh, these two territories, right. uh, as places that would make determinations about whether or not to have slavery based on popular sovereignty. Now, one, uh, the act goes into effect. There's tremendous difficulty with enforcing it. So Pierce has got to send in marshals troops. and troops and various people to try and enforce it. But he's doing so to help the pro-slavery forces in Kansas, particularly which is going to be split pretty much down the middle between pro and anti-slavery forces. Um, and thus, there's a, a precursor to the Civil War called Ble Bleeding Kansas, where there's literally a civil war in Kansas. Right. And Pierce is siding with the pro-slavery forces. Now, all of this is hurting his popularity and chances to get reelected. And Buchanan is in Great Britain. He doesn't have to, make, he doesn't have to say anything. Uh, comes back, and of course, the can I go into the election of 1856? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so, We're there. <laughs> so here's my little, hopefully, humorous spiel about the election of 1856, which is something that's not on everybody's mind, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but we've just gone through this, and I guess still are going through, this thing that people think is the most cataclysmic election, no matter which side you were on. Whoever was going to win it was going to be, you know, the world was going to hell in a handbasket, right, as they say. But... I'm going to take you back to 1856, and right, right around here, actually. So in 1853, there was a president of the Whig Party in the presidency. It was Millard Fillmore. He was left over because Zachary Taylor had died, but he was a Whig, and he was in office. In 1854, there was no Whig Party. I, it really, they, 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 ran, they ran this ineffectual guy, not Fillmore. They passed over Fillmore. Uh, uh, another general, they had only actually elected generals, the Whigs, Taylor and Harrison, both of whom died in office. So they went back to like this, another old man general, Winfield Scott, and he got clobbered by Pierce. Hmm. So, so now you're left with this shards of a party that, that not exactly, but sort of becomes two other parties. One, and this should tell you everything you want to know about a presidential election and how bizarre it can be. One was uh, a party called the Know Nothing Party. Now it was called the American Party, but they all called themselves the Know Nothing Party. And if you can imagine an election where a party calls itself the Know Nothing Party, <laughs> right? You, got, you really got the election going on. And so what uh, they met over here at about 11th and Market at a place called National Hall because it was going to be patriotic. We're going to, do it to go back to Philadelphia and have a convention. Uh, their party platform, essentially the party platform was, get this, anti-immigrant. Of course, those immigrants were not from Mexico or Syria. They were from Ireland and uh, Germany, and they were Catholics. And they were going to come to the cities and take our jobs. And the Pope was going to set up shops somewhere around 15th in Pennsylvania. <laughs> so you have that party. And they've got nobody to, but they've got no standard bearer, except that they find somebody, somebody who really wanted to be back in the White House, Millard Fillmore. There, I could not find a writing from Millard Fillmore that said anything about Catholics or immigration or anything like this, until, of course, after, after he gets nominated. But he wants to be back in, so they nominate him. You know, he's you know, somebody of note in America. So then there's this other party, the Republican Party. They, well, they call themselves the Republican Party. And they uh, formed themselves up in the upper Midwest, some say in Michigan, some say in Wisconsin, but in any case, up there. Uh, and they come here to Philadelphia, too. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to 8th and Locust, but there's a place called Musical Fund Hall. It was the first hall in, Phil in the United States built for music. 
It's incredibly small. It's still there. It's nine condos now. That's as big as it is. They had a convention there of a major party. And uh, their platform was not exactly anti-slavery, but not having slavery in the territories. This Kansas-Nebraska thing is going on. That's really sort of the impetus. And uh, so guess what they nominate? They don't have anybody nominated either. Well, they do. They could have nominated William Seward or David Strathairn, as you probably know him better from Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he sort of says, I don't know, new party. He's a Whig, you know, new party. Maybe, you know, they're not going to be in the ballot in the South. I'm not going to win. Maybe I'll wait it out for a little while. So they're looking around, and they nominate a celebrity, a guy named John Fremont. He's called the Pathfinder. And uh, what he has done, of note, is that he and Kit Carson of Western fame, mapped out the West. They mapped out the trails to the West. Now, as a favor, he got a little military governorship for a time in California, but basically he was never in office. Uh, but what he did do, smartly, is marry right. Not somebody from uh, Slovenia, or no, not Slovenia, she's from, right. But anyway, she married a 17-year-old daughter of the longest standing Democratic Senator Thomas Benton, Jesse Benton, who, you know, Washington's not that big a place. She's in society, you know, she's well-educated and all that other stuff. And she becomes uh, the Chris Kardashian to John Fremont's uh, Bruce Jenner. She sees something in this guy. He's written journals about his trip, but they are boring. So she's good writer. She gussies them up. She takes them all around Washington. And it becomes, I suppose, what you would call a bestseller today, but certainly an influential thing. And so he's popular enough to be nominated for president. In any case, so, but the fact remains that Buchanan, who is now left over, 65 years old, an old man. He's been hanging around for a long time. And on the 17th ballot in Cincinnati, they finally come around and say, all right, it's your turn. <laughs> you know? And... Uh, and so he gets nominated. And of course, he's the, it's the only party that's together. The know-nothings are sort of you know, flaky. And the Republicans couldn't get in the ballot in the South because the Deep South wouldn't let them. As a matter of fact, it's funny that, that the know-nothings take one state, and it's Maryland. Now, those of you who know history, who founded Maryland? The Catholics. I don't know. You know so this anti-Catholic party wins the Catholic state. So, so um, in any case, Buchanan wins. Uh, so, so we have the, James Buchanan, President of the United States, 1856, elected. And this is, you know, looking back, of course, we see this, we know this is a pivotal time. And I think it's fair to say Buchanan recognizes that as well. Right. But even before he becomes president, he's already beginning to stumble. Right. So uh, tell us how he... Uh, Okay. Gets up to the presidency from election right. day to the right. inauguration. Well, it's probably no back then. There was a longer uh, interregnum, or whatever you want to call it, between the election in November. He didn't take office until March. Buchanan has decided that his legacy was, is going to be solving the slavery question because it's a big deal and has been a you know. So that's not so bad, right? But. Uh, the way he does this is he sees this court case swimming around, uh, the Dred Scott case. Well, you're the constitutional law scholar. You want to explain, or do you want me to explain Dred Scott? Well, you know, Dred Scott is uh, both in the background of this story, but also it's going to be in the forefront of it as right. well. So it's, it's a test case to some extent that's really sort of challenging Congress's authority to be able to restrict slavery in the federal territories. At the same time, it's going to raise issues about whether or not somebody who is either once a slave, maybe is no longer a slave, but in any event is an African American, and whether that person has the entitlement that a US citizen would have to be able to bring a case in federal court. So these are among the issues that are percolating in this case. Um, they're obviously critical issues. Uh, and if the court decides this issue, it could theoretically take it all out of the uh, jurisdiction or power of the political authorities. The court, in a sense, would have solved it. So this case is pending at the time Buchanan has been elected. And as he 
is prepares for his inauguration. Right. So, so his. Did any of you go to Dickinson College? Well, you can be blamed for the Civil War. I just want to tell you right around. Oh boy. <laughs> so they, Buchanan was a Dickinson graduate, as was the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger Tawney. Not that they were friends. Tawney was older, but and I, I, I don't for a minute believe that they only got together because of that. But in any case, this case is coming around, but the court is split, not five, five to four, but not conservative or liberal necessarily, but Southern and Northern. And Tawney, and you, you, they see this case coming around, but Tawney decides, you know, if it's a five to four Southern Northern split, it's not gonna be as effective uh, a, a case. It's gonna be seen by America as just this Another case that the Southerners win, but so what? Uh, so Buchanan takes it upon himself to ignore the separation of powers because I guess he isn't president yet. And uh, uh, Tony says, well, if you can get somebody uh, from the North on the Supreme Court to uh, go along with us, then maybe this will be a, a signal decision, much like Brown versus Board of Education was a unanimous decision when, when it probably wouldn't have been if it were a minor case. So Buchanan finds, guess what? Another guy on the Supreme Court who went to Dickinson College. And uh, he's from Pennsylvania, and he convinces him to vote with a majority. Another New York justice says, well, I'll write a concurring opinion. So it's essentially seven to two now instead of five to four. And the decision comes out two days after this great celebration, the greatest celebration mid-century America, Buchanan's inaugural ball, 6,000 people on Lafayette Square in front of the White House, and huge tents, you know, in the, the American unit of measurement, three football fields long, Spot, Star Spangles, 100-piece orchestra, uh, food that, you, you, that, that nobody had ever imagined, and, uh, and Buchanan buying the wine. And he was, apparent, like I said, a good party giver. He probably bought good wine. In any case, two days later, this decision comes down. And that sort of, the slide is bad because it is decided that. Well, uh, so a couple of things. I mean, first, um, at least it's reputed and written about in some of the historical <laughs> um, books on Dred Scott that Buchanan even kind of asked Tawney as he's walking up right. to the dais for his inauguration about the decision, and Tawney basically reassures him it's coming, which, if you think about it, is a remarkable conversation to be having. And what Buchanan's been doing, and I guess there are letters we, we can yeah. find, is he's been lobbying these justices by writing letters. We have the president-elect lobbying sitting Supreme Court justices in a pending case, which turns out to be the most horrific decision the Supreme Court <laughs> has ever rendered. Um, but it comes down, um, as you say, shortly after he's um, inaugurated, and the decision uh, reaches several uh, calamitous results. One of them is it strikes down the federal law that was restricting slavery in the territories, saying Congress doesn't have the power to restrict slavery in these territories because slave owners have a fundamental right to own their slaves that, which cannot be interfered with by legislation. It's a remarkable decision. This decision also holds that African Americans may never be, never were, nor ever will be, or can be, citizens of the United States. So these are now pronouncements in constitutional law, which can't be overturned by legislation. They can only be overturned by oh, an course. amendment, which isn't forthcoming, and therefore we then come back to the story, what happens to the country now that Buchanan's president and the decisions come down. Okay, and the other thing you have to understand about, the, about America then is it's expanding. It's been expanding. There was a panic in 1837 having to do with banks, but for the last 20 years, it's been gangbusters in the United States. You know, the, new, the new territories bought, uh, as you know, you know, beyond the Louisiana Purchase, Oregon, Texas, California, all the other stuff. And railroads are spurring this. You know, rail, it, the American dream is really going on. I mean, you can take it just in the Mormons. You know, they, they didn't make it in New York, so they went to several other states before they get to Utah. Uh, and that was just the, the way of America. That's, and even if you didn't go, you always had the thought you could. Uh, and the railroad would get you there, because now you didn't have to just take a covered wagon, although many people did, of course. But, but anyway, so the railroads are the prime moving force in America. Uh, a lot of speculation. 
Stephen Douglas was a big speculator, and William Seward was a big speculator, even you know, those people. Uh, so this, this decision comes down, and let's say you have a tin cup factory over here in Lancaster, you know, your friends of the Buchanans, and it's going well, and suddenly you say, well, you know, maybe I'll expand to Harrisburg. Well, I don't know now. The, the Tawny family could be coming up from slaveholding Maryland, build a plant with, a, you know, a factory with slave labor. So precipitously, because the northern manufacturing business isn't as many people as it is today, uh, things stop. So railroads start not going anywhere. People aren't moving decide not to move anywhere. So all that speculation goes down the drain. Businesses dry up extremely quickly, within months. All the banks in New York close for a day. Uh, don't take script, only take gold. Well, you and your tin cup factory aren't scraping off a piece of gold to give to your employees. Uh, so Buchanan's reaction to this is, is what becomes his typical reaction, nothing. We're not gonna do anything. You guys in the North, you should have known better. You shouldn't speculate. We'll, pay, we'll, we'll finish up the projects we have, but we're not doing any more. You should have been like the people in the South who could feed and clothe themselves. So that starts a greater North-South split. So, so we have a North-South split, which has been sharpened by not just the decision of Dred Scott, but obviously by Buchanan's one, I, I guess you could call it passive aggressive or right. in, indecision or uh, in any event. Um, but Buchanan couldn't find any authority within the federal government to deal with the economic crisis. Right. And he felt the, the Supreme Court decision had solved the slavery solved. difficulty. So what other problems does Buchanan then encounter during his presidency? Well, he encounters, he encounters Kansas, which is a huge problem. It's sort of been left over for him. Uh, by the Pierce administration. And, and in this, this case, there were uh, competing capitals of Kansas, the Kansas Territory. Now, not many people live there, but it's near Missouri, and uh, certain slave holding or slave uh, endear, endearing forces start a, a, a capital in Lecompton and draw up a, a, a potential uh, constitution that says this will be a pro slavery state. And then you know, free soil kinds of people go to Topeka and do the same thing. He's got to make a decision. Like, there's only going to be one capital. This is not uh, Ecuador where they have a governmental capital and a social capital. You know, this is going to, you're going to have to have one. Now, there's not that many people there. And by one account, there are this many slaves in all of Kansas, six. Now, the may, other accounts may have said different. So you have this sort of place be, possibly becoming a slave state with no slaves in it. So uh, Buchanan sends advisors there, essentially makes no decision. At the same time, there comes a man, John Brown, who you've all heard of. And he, he does some dirty deeds in, in Kansas, kills people, or allegedly kills people, and then goes off. And uh, Buchanan decides, on top of everything else, that we're going to let him go. It's not, uh, it's not part of what I want to do. But he still doesn't make a decision about what to do about these two capitals and this fomenting war, this mini war the professors talked about. In the meantime, I'll tell you about one little piece of 19th century lore, and that's the pig war. Have you, have you all known about the pig war? You studied that in high school, I'm sure. Anyway, so there's this territory up, well, you'll be facing this way, up there, you know, like up above the Olympic Peninsula in Washington, not very well settled sort of a border between Canada and the United States, but there are settlers up there. Well, uh, at some point, this, a pig comes on. I'm going to rush this through, but I, I love the pig war, so I really want to. It's very important in our society. It really is, actually. So, so uh, at some point, this wild pig comes on the property, or what the, the alleged settler's property of an American. He shoots it, kills it. Well, that pig happens to be owned by the Hudson Bay Company, the Koch brothers of Canada. You know? <laughs> They're the guys who run Canada. So there's a standoff. And Buchanan possibly thinks that, well, I'm going to redeem myself for not getting more territory when I was Secretary of State up there. And he takes um, General Pickett, who becomes you know, the guy who lost the Confederacy, you know, the Civil War for the Confederacy at Gettysburg, 
But anyway, he sends him, and he's in Kansas. Now, you've got to remember, there's only about 12,000 troops in the whole United States. He sends a brigade, a battalion, whatever number of people with Pickett up to solve this pig war problem. Well, there are no B-1 bombers. They've got to walk all the way from Kansas, right? It's taken a long time. They're needed in Kansas, right? They're not needed. When they, when they get up there, I'm sure it's just like Thanksgiving. They're eating the pig together, right? Because nothing really happens, but it's taken a long time. It's taken this whole number of troops away. And it's sort of, beyond taking the troops away, it's the idea of what you're doing. Uh, so so he, he makes, the, this, these are the kinds of decisions he makes. He, we, we invade Paraguay. You know, we wouldn't invade Paraguay now, but on then. You know, there, there was a little, you know, it was an idea that he wanted more slave states. He was a southern leaning guy. So invading Paraguay may get some of Central America up there. If he was going to build a wall, it would have been down in Tierra del Fuego, and all those people would have been part of the United States. So, and meanwhile, he's got a visit from Robert E. Lee. Right. So, yes. Yeah, so then, so then. Uh, John Brown comes around and he comes to Harper's Ferry. Have you ever been to Harper's Ferry? Beautiful place. It was a big factory place then. It's not like the Potemkin village it is now, right? It, it's along those two rivers. It's beautiful, but it's a real industrial area, four, 40 miles from Washington. Uh, Brown comes there. It's not so stupid that he has his 18 people wherever he has, you know, trying to get the armaments, get them out, uh, get some publicity, get some more uh, uh, followers. It's not, he's not unknown. He's visited with... Frederick Douglass and Harry Tubman and whoever else, you know, William Lloyd Garrison. He's, he's a well-known figure. Uh, but that first day there, Buchanan hears about it and he says, I don't know, let Virginia take care of it. Except that fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you view the Civil War, uh, a guy named Robert E. Lee comes up from Texas where he's stationed. He's visiting his family in Arlington. And somehow he gets together with Buchanan and says, doesn't seem like what we should be doing. And he, says, and he kind of says, all right, so take a few guys over there. And of course, Lee uh, captures Brown, and they, you know, there's, a mock, there's a sort of a show trial, and he gets uh, convicted of things that he didn't do, actually, uh, and gets hanged not too many months later. But by now, he's a symbol. Now the abolitionists finally have a symbol, and it's John Brown. Uh, they were. They were sort of like a little party off to the side, even through this time. But now, now the slavery, anti-slavery forces are really at odds. And, and they're in such odds, and we're going to sort of fast forward a little bit. They're at such right. odds, of course, that by the time Buchanan's uh, one and only term is over, and he only vows to serve one term, uh, secession right. has already begun. And what was his response to that? Can't do much about it. His, his response is the Constitution <laughs> says that they can't secede. They're bound together. But I can't do anything about it. And as they, seven states secede between the time Lincoln is elected and Buchanan leaves office. And in addition to letting the secede, his friends are all from the South. So he, take, he takes it personally almost. He has nobody to hang out with anymore. He, he like, like the stories about Nixon wandering around the White House, well, Buchanan was just like that. He invites people that he barely knows to like, stay at the White House with him uh, because you know, he doesn't know exactly what to do. John Tyler wants to have a commission to save the Union. He says, I don't know. We can't do anything about it. You, know, you can meet John, but I don't know what I'm going to do. So, uh, so by the time, and they've, now all these states have seceded, but they've also taken all the armaments. You know, they've, they've, Fort Sumter is about what's left. There's three little islands off of Florida and Fort Sumter. That's it in the south that, that's left by the time Lincoln takes over. So, Now, throughout all of this, I'm sort of curious about a couple things. One is, does he have a constitutional philosophy at all? Well, I mean, to the extent that it's a restrained constitutional philosophy, it is. But I think it's really more that it's the type of guy he is. First of all, he's old, right? And he's not sort of kept up with modernity, right? Other than party. And uh, um, so he's still viewing the country as, e it was pretty small then, but even smaller, where, you know, if I go and talk to Roger Tawney, we'll solve the world's problems. You know, we don't have to have like a real constitutional philosophy. We'll take it piece by piece. Well, he did take it piece by piece. And at every fork in the road, he took the wrong time, <laughs> you know? And what about, uh, and of course, today in modern times, we attach some importance 
to uh, a, president, um, a president's use of the bully pulpit, right. to the pre president's rhetoric. And obviously, among the presidents you mentioned is remembered as among our greatest, obviously, Lincoln is revered for his mastery of language, memorable rhetoric, and really stirring mm -hmm. um, language. Uh, that's not Buchanan. No, he's not. <laughs> he's, he, he writes a lot of letters. I mean, and, and he's certainly literate. I mean, if you read, I mean, you know, when you do a book like this, you read all these letters. Uh, they're essentially meaningless. But, but, uh, but he, he, doesn't, he doesn't, since he doesn't have a philosophy, he's not sitting there thinking about the Emancipation Proclamation and the Gettysburg Address. And there's sort of no opportunity to do that. There's no uh, uh, dedication of battlefields or things like that for him to go to. So we've got uh, a number of questions from the audience, okay. and I'm going to ask a, a few of them. Here, here's one. Um, what influenced Buchanan in his background to be pro-slavery? Oh, OK. So, so he's what's called a doe face. They called him doe face. He was a, a, a southern-leaning northerner. Uh, the the doe face thing comes from the southerners can manipulate your face into whatever shape they wanted to. Uh, some people say that he was from southern Pennsylvania, and that's really not the part of it. He, he, he was in Washington so long. And in Washington, Washington was a southern city. I mean, there was still a slave trade when he first gets there. There's, it's certainly a slave city. It's, it's, a, it's a temporary city. And most of the people that come there and hang out are southerners. The northerners live fairly close. The railroads are better. They can get home faster. So the, the, the town's a southern town, and he's a single guy. Uh, living in boarding houses, even when he lives in, ha even when he finally buys a house, his friends are all Southern. Well, you know, your friends are what your friends are. You, you'll give them, you'll cut them a break. And so his, his feeling about slavery was essentially, I wouldn't have any, but you know, my friends do, and it works for them. So uh, here's another question about uh, Buchanan and, and slavery, but with Dred Scott in the, in the picture. Mm -hmm. Is it true that Buchanan advocated public acceptance of the Dred Scott decision before Chief Justice Taney delivered it? Oh, he did. He, it, it, it's not, there's not a real indication that he knew exactly what it was. First of all, one of the things he did in the great celebration is he, he, got, he did a bunch of um, uh, transcripts of his speech to hand out to the audience at, uh, you know, at the Capitol. And a couple of the lines from his real inaugural address are not in that because as legend has it, as the professor said, Tony came up to him and said, there's going to be this decision. So he said, he, he alludes to some decision that's coming up, uh, but not exactly what it was. And certainly it becomes, one, it, it, Dred Scott, for what it's worth, is the first instance of a lot of different things. I mean, one of them is one of the first instances in which the court really tries to solve, uh, so to speak, right. a major political and social issue one that's quite divisive. And the court tries to sort of be the arbiter of it. But obviously, it's coming down heavily in that decision, solely in that decision on the side of um, pro-slavery forces. The other thing that the court does um, is it finds this fundamental right that slave owners have with respect to owning slaves. Um, and the recognition of a fundamental right in the Constitution was a very difficult thing to find. Uh, where could it be found? It's found the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment. Um, and for many people, that's the beginning of a doctrine called substantive due process, which continues to pose a lot of problems for people whenever the court finds a right that's not spelled out in the Constitution, but then enforces it uh, at the expense of states and, and uh, democratic authorities. So Dred Scott's going to produce a lot of problems. And the fact that Buchanan comes down squarely on its side is another instance in which the president, in a sense, is um, uh, siding with, is supporting the Supreme Court um, and pointing to it as a very important thing. We, so just like in this most recent election and other elections, the court kind of was front and center. People knew Dred Scott was going to be important, and it obviously became important. Yeah, and you've got to put yourself back in those days. It, 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 slavery was accepted. I mean, it was definitely accepted. Uh, there were people who were clearly against it. But the vast amount of American non-slaveholders accepted that it existed. And, and you know, I'm sure you've always heard that there are only certain small percentage of people in the South that own slaves. But it's, it's, there, it was the Southern team against the Northern team. So to the extent that you were you know, an American dreaming Southerner without slaves, 
I don't know that you aspired to have slaves, but you aspired to what the slave owners had, which is larger land, better, 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 right? So, so it's, not, it's not so unusual for the South to be sort of one whole. Uh, I, I use the analogy of the, uh, you know, once again, sports analogy, you know, the SEC versus the Big Ten. To, to the extent that Mississippi beats Michigan, if you're in the South, you know, that's one of your wins, even if you're from Alabama. Right. Um, so now we can start thinking as well about other presidents, but particularly other lesser presidents. Anybody else in your judgment close to Buchanan, or who's closest to Buchanan at the bottom? Well, when I write about this in the book, I, I try to tell about other people who rated presidents, but I would have to say Franklin Pierce does come number two because he did pretty much the same thing <laughs> that Buchanan did. He, he's the only president to have his same cabinet through his whole term. But the person who has his ear is Jefferson Davis, who, you know, like, like people talked about Dick Cheney being the real president during the Bush administration, you would have to say to a certain extent, Jefferson Davis was the real president during the Pierce administration. And uh, in a certain sense, that held the country together because you had this Southerner with great influence. Uh, so the one mark that Pierce does not have is that the Civil War didn't start on his watch. It kept getting pushed off longer and longer. Well, one thing Pierce and, I guess, Buchanan then have in common is they are clearly on the losing side of history. Right. So is that, that, does that really, in effect, become a criterion? To a certain extent. You know, obviously, people will say Richard Nixon because he, you know, Watergate and all this other, you know, what everyone, the resignation, however you want to characterize that. Uh, but there are a certain amount of things that Nixon did right. You know, he, you know, he started the EPA. He opened trade to China. There's several other smaller things than that. Uh, and his cataclysm was cheating, or whatever you want to call Watergate. Not, still not, still doesn't rank with the Civil War. So, well, um, it's safe to say nothing will. Um, so we can just. Uh, I always win right. in that argument. Uh, there's a question about Warren Harding right. and whether Harding is um, as bad as his reputation. Uh, the question is, if he had not died in office, would he have resolved the, the so-called Teapot Dome scandal? Right. Um, OK, well, so there's two things about Harding that are really bad. One is the Teapot Dome scandal, which in fact did not indict him, but many members of his inner circle. It was, it was a scandal about oil rights, which we won't get into longer. But suffice it to say that a lot of people were on the take. Uh, the other thing is that he had uh, affiances in, the, in his term, and now it's been recently, I guess, proven that he fathered a child by another woman in the White House, or just before the White House. I'm not sure exactly the timing. But, um, but the other thing Harding did was, like Polk, he came to office with a certain imprimatur. Uh, he, and he was pro-business, and he brought many people into the administration that were pretty good. Mm -hmm. Charles Evans Hughes and, and uh, other people who, uh, Andrew Mellon, people of great influence who uh, you could say were good or bad because, based on your political view, but certainly they were giants in their field. And so he did so do something more positive than these other guys. So uh, another question from the audience is, is it better to make a wrong decision or make no decision at all? Well, if you assume the decision is wrong, obviously, no. Now, I mean, of course, you know, one of the, one of the other horrific Supreme Court cases was Korematsu, you know, the Japanese internment uh, uh, edict by Roosevelt. And that's a pretty bad decision. But under duress, you know, at the time, it seemed not quite as bad as Dred Scott. But, uh, if you assume the decision is bad, of course not. But, but I think that most people would say that most of the decisions Washington, Jefferson, and Washington Lincoln, and Roosevelt made were uh, thoughtful, uh, you know, had to be made because they were cataclysmic times. You know, the Great Depression or, or World War II or the Civil War or, or whatever, or starting the nation was what Washington did. I always say that Buchanan is the second most consequential American, that you know, Washington started everything, and Buchanan saw, oversaw its coming apart. And I would say to a certain 
degree, we're still living through that today. So uh, uh, we've had several questions about the more recent election, uh -huh. um, that which will not be named. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I don't want to go there. Um, but I do want to sort of look at um, a particular aspect of it, because I think here's an interesting question that kind of gets us um, to that aspect. Are there any rating systems for president, presidential candidates to look at criteria that might shed light on the eventual success in their presidencies of elected? Well, like I said, I'm repeating myself a bit, but, but they're decisive. Uh, I think that the, if, if, well, if I were advising Mrs. Clinton and Mr. Trump at looking at certain presidents, I could say, well, you can look at Washington and Lincoln, but it's not likely the Civil War is going to start, and you're not starting a new country. So what presented themselves to them, probably, probably uh, uh, not really relatable to you. So then where do you go? Well, do you want to be James Monroe? Or, you know, so a pretty good president. Well, that's like saying I want to write a biography of the fourth best Phillies player. You know, it's just not really sort of where you're aspiring to. But what you can do is look at somebody like this, or Franklin Pierce, or the worst presidents, and decide not to be like them. So as a candidate, I don't know what you can find. But when, when we reflect you know, upon it afterwards, I think you'll find well, it. Well, sometimes it's 2020 hindsight. I mean, right, some, right. Yeah, so sometimes you can, um, I mean, you can look back and say, oh, yes, you know, G. Franklin D. Roosevelt really did turn out to be a great orator. Or, right. Um, I mean, it's, it's hard, for, again, to come back to a theme here. It's hard to look at Lincoln's career before he becomes president to be able yeah. to grasp the extraordinary talents and abilities that this person later turns out to have. I mean, he was a successful lawyer. He was a one-term member of Congress. That was it. His entire exposure to the federal government was one term in Congress. Yet there's nobody as president of the United States who deals with a bigger mess, a bigger constitutional challenge, a bigger problem for the federal government than Abraham Lincoln. And by most accounts, he rises to that challenge. Um, but w where you could find that, uh, it's hard to say, but it was found. I mean, I yeah. guess. Uh, be kind of as consequential in his being elected, and I won't get into it, but the Democratic Party was split into three. So Lincoln got 39.8% of the vote. Now, if you think that Donald Trump didn't get 150% you know, of the vote, 30, a, a president elected with less than 40% of the vote, given that, of course, no women and blacks and were voting, but still, uh, is, is pretty extraordinary to become this. Now, and you can also say, well, you know, he didn't have a great bar to jump over in James Buchanan to become a great president, but, he, but you just have to separate that time out. You know, you're not comparing. I, I don't think there's a lot of comparison between Lincoln and, and Buchanan. Lincoln was faced with, with, the, uh, with the problem set before him. So uh, I'm going to ask a variation of a question that's kind of also been written up, which is, okay, given um, how awful our presidents can be, you know, yeah. Franklin Pierce, James Buchanan, those that compete for the bottom. What should we be on the lookout for over the next four years in order to be able to figure out, okay, my gosh, we have, we're living through X era. Yeah. Um, of the past few weeks, I've been traveling around the country. Well, all these speaking engagements I've had at Carter Library and David Axelrod's Institute in Chicago. And I've been all around. And as I'm driving, because I drove, four or 5,000 miles, mm. you're sitting thinking, right? You know, yeah. you might be listening to, NPR or country music or Rush Limbaugh or whatever, you know, when you drive that far, you'll listen to anything. And, uh, and, but, you know, I, I was thinking, most of what I was thinking was when I'm driving through a red state, all the blue things. And when I'm driving through a blue state, all the red things. And I heard a woman on the air You're probably say, driving through a lot of red states. A lot of red states, <laughs> right, right, right. And, you know, it, this woman was from Kansas. She's saying, well, you know, I mean, 45% of the people, this is before the election, 45% of the people in 2012 voted for Obama in Kansas, yet Kansas has become this great reactionary place. So, uh, so it, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to imagine what, you're, what you want to be looking for, what you want to be, what, what you want to be saying and that, that you'll see. But I, I sort of predict, unless you count Trump as this kind of person, that the next presidential election that Trump is not in whether it's four years from now or eight years from now, there's going to be, I think there's going to be call for charismatic candidates. Uh, 
I don't think you can call, I, I don't think you can call Donald Trump that, and, and I, I certainly don't think you can call Hillary Clinton that, but you sort of could call Barack Obama that. I think there's going to be a call for both parties to have somebody, I hesitate to say not of substance, because they may be of substance too, but somebody who is extremely attractive, who is John Kennedy, who is Dwight Eisenhower, who's you know, somebody, you know, somebody of, that, of that ilk. Oh, another thing I, I might venture to suggest, and just see if you agree <laughs> with this, um, is, is the unpredictability of world affairs and domestic affairs. Uh, oftentimes, if you look back through different presidencies, what uh, turns out to be the interesting and, and real test, the great challenge, is not so much what the president saw coming, but what the president didn't see coming, right. or what the nation didn't see coming, and how the president then responds to a situation that was simply unpredictable. Right, I, I, I would agree with that, and, 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 and at every moment, when my, my buddy Buchanan has this moment, he blows it. You know, the panic of 1857, you know, the Dred Scott decision, Kansas, there's other small uh, situations, the pig war, whatever it is, uh, uh, that it clearly couldn't have been predicted. He just doesn't make the right decision. And what you hope is you elect a president who does. I mean, I, I know liberals aren't great fans of Ronald Reagan, but when Reagan said he would do something, he did it. Now, you know, the air traffic controllers, he says, don't strike, I'm going to fire you. Well, they did, and he did. So uh, uh, to, the, to the extent that he can take responsibility for the fall of the Berlin Wall, I mean, he, he did. You know, he did sort of take that responsibility, he, he, and he ran with it. Uh, so uh, I think that that's sort of the response, you know? And of course, we're here today talking about Pennsylvania's only native son, who's become president of the United States. Um, um, and there will be brighter days ahead, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I also want to make sure, before, you, uh, before we wrap everything up, that you tell the audience a little bit more about the area where we're located. So what we're near in terms of Buchanan's history. Buchanan, yeah. yeah. Well, I told you about the conventions being here. But you know, Buchanan's out from out in Lancaster. Now, when he came to Lancaster from uh, Dickinson, it was the largest inland city in America, 6,000 people. So you, you, now you go through Lancaster and you're looking for you know, Amish you know, carts and all. But, but it was a significant place. It was the capital of Pennsylvania before it moved to Harrisburg. Uh, um, and you know, in any case, going, for him to go there was really important. It was a real a center of law. The richest man perhaps in America, was, was almost going to be his father-in-law. And Coleman was his fiance. Edward Coleman was a, a big iron baron. He was certainly very rich. He didn't really like James Buchanan, thought he was too much of a partier. She goes out with him. Uh, he comes home one day from Philadelphia. I'll tell you this sort of last social story, but it's, it's sort of almost hard to believe that somebody could be elected after this. But he, he comes home, he visits, his, on, on his way back home, he visits his friend, his friend's wife's cousin is there, apparently a good looking young woman, gossip as such as it is, goes on in Lancaster. The word comes back to Ann Coleman about this. She breaks off the engagement, sends him a letter. Buchanan, as is usual, says, I don't know, I think I'll wait it out, right? <laughs> Soon after that, her, as her father seeing her despondent, says, well, why don't you go visit your sister in Philadelphia? And so she and her younger sister go visit their older sister in Philly. They're going to go to the theater, just like you might do today. There was theater in Philadelphia was the theater capital of America in, in that time, in the early part of the 19th century. So they, uh, they come here, and they get here, and uh, Anne says, I'm not feeling all that well. Why don't you two go out? So they do. Well, while they're out, she goes into convulsions. And the, the man that they're staying with over at 518 Walnut Street, which is sort of behind the Penn Mutual, old Penn Mutual building there, uh, says, brings the doctor in. And he sort of quells her down. And uh, the other girls, other women come home. And she goes into convulsions again and dies like that. So it's pretty much. It's pretty sure she committed suicide. I won't say that it's absolutely sure. But apparently, she was taking laudanum 
which I don't really know much about, but, uh, uh, and probably killed herself over this traumatic thing. So Buchanan wants to go to the funeral. The parents don't let him go to the funeral. It doesn't, you know, he sends a letter, they send it back. Uh, but how he becomes famous after that is that he's a hardworking lawyer and everybody says, oh my God, his fiance just died and he's still working so hard. And everybody starts giving him cases, he becomes the richest lawyer in Lancaster. There you go. Well, that also may be a partial answer to the last question I was gonna ask, because um, I want to end it on a slightly happier note. Right. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, and that, Buchanan was a self-made man. Right. Uh, so he didn't come from money. No, he didn't come from money. His father was an Irish immigrant, uh, and he, he opens up a store uh, along the road going to Pittsburgh from, you know, in, in the middle of nowhere, and it was sort of the last general store, and eventually he becomes a better general store, but by the time, and see, he's well off enough to send his son to Dickinson, which is a new college, uh, but, you know, finishing school in a certain sense, and, uh, but he makes himself, you know, a good lawyer. He, he apparently was a very industrious, smart, guy, like I said, the, the whole partying thing has to do with being a lawyer, right? I mean, you have to sort of schmooze everybody. And, uh, and he, he's, he's, in, he's impressed with, he, he, he takes heroes. Jackson was a hero of his, and uh, you know, John Calhoun was a hero of his. You know, he, he, when, he find, when he gets to the place, he always finds the, the premier guy there. He found the premier lawyer in Lancaster to apprentice under. Uh, he gets to Washington, he finds the people to hang out with. I mean, look, you gotta remember, back then, everybody knows everybody, you know? He knew every president from Madison to Lincoln, right? Uh, and I guess Johnson, he was, still lived, he was still alive when Andrew Johnson was. So he knows all these presidents. Well, they're not exactly, you know, you can go look at what they're wearing. I mean, Madison's not wearing the same thing Lincoln's wearing, right? Doesn't have a beard, even. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, yeah, so you can be the self-made man who becomes president. I mean, they're, they're plotting. He was, I call him the plotting to the top president. He, he made it over a long period of time. Well, one thing I think we can be sure of is we're not going to have many opportunities to talk about James Buchanan this much right. um, ever at the National Constitution Center. Um, he's gotten a lot of focus, um, maybe more now than he'll get over the next few years, because something tells me events will overshadow him yet again. <laughs> Um, but I want to thank you for a very wonderful and interesting and insightful conversation, which may, be, may help us understand um, our, our future as we think about what's going to be happening, not just um, in the next four years, whatever, but we want to think about, okay, how do we evaluate candidates? How do we evaluate presidents? These are always critical questions we need to ask ourselves. And of course, there's no better place to ask them than here. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me.